Hey guys, welcome to this episode featuring a really cool speaker, Robin Brogdon, the founder and CEO of Blueprints Veterinary Marketing Group. So we sat down to discuss managing difficult conversations from the standpoint of a CSR, and we certainly did cover some of the more difficult topics that may come up for CSRs, but and truthfully, we dug into so much more than that, both from the point of view of a CSR, but also from the point of view of the clinical team working in the treatment area and an ownership and management perspective. So yeah, there was just a lot to unpack here. And to be honest, we had some pre-planned talking points, but really we kind of immediately veered off of any pre-planned points and just had a great conversation about so many different parts of the non-clinical side of working in a veterinary hospital. We covered topics like communication, evaluations, consistency, core values, so many things that really were not on my radar when we started this conversation. And I think Robin did such a wonderful job of illustrating the importance of some of these concepts that I sort of had a hard time wrapping my head around before this conversation. So it's just a very multifaceted discussion, and I really hope you guys get as much out of it as I did. Robin was just a wonderful person to talk to. Robin Brogdon is the founder and chief executive officer of the award-winning Blueprints Veterinary Marketing Group. After earning a master's degree in communication and marketing, Robin began her career in sports marketing. Her three decades of experience, including work for a Big Ten University athletic department, a professional sports franchise, an action sports media company, management of veterinary specialty hospitals, and most importantly, as a pet owner, gives Robin the breadth of knowledge and pure passion to help her clients achieve their goals. Robin has experience with companies at all stages, from startup to acquisition and divestiture, along with managing multiple construction and relocation projects, most notably the building and operational launch of a City of Los Angeles Veterinary Specialty Center in Los Angeles, a 30,000 square foot multi-specialty hospital. Can you imagine? Among the projects for which Robin is most proud, as if that wasn't enough, was the opportunity to rename and rebrand Kansas State University's Veterinary Teaching Hospital. Robin supports the industry in many ways. She completed two terms, six years, on the ACVIM Foundation Board of Directors and was the first non-veterinarian chose to serve in this capacity. Upon conclusion of her service, Robin was honored with the ACVIM Distinguished Service Award, again, the first non-veterinarian to receive such a distinction. In addition, she's a sought-after speaker at veterinary conferences and a published author of numerous articles, book chapters, and the popular 101 Veterinary Marketing Questions Answered Through AHA Press. Since its inception, Robin has been an instructor in the UC Davis Fundamentals of Business Certificate Program and more recently has become a regular lecturer at Western University College of Veterinary Medicine. In 2012, Robin launched and was appointed the inaugural president of the Collaborative Care Coalition, formerly VetSoap.org a nonprofit initiative with a mission to demonstrate the benefits of collaborative care between primary care veterinarians and specialists. She's currently the president of Vet Partners. All right, let's go ahead and get into our episode. Well, on this episode, I am lucky enough to be joined by Robin Brogdon of Blueprints Veterinary Marketing Group. And we're going to talk about something that I mean, kind of in my opinion, a conversation that's long overdue, and that's tough client conversations from the perspective of a CSR. That's such a hard job to do. I will say it is the, the one of the jobs I have not done in the veterinary field, and I'm I'm honestly kind of okay with that. So coming from the standpoint of someone who has had some of these really tough conversations we're going to be addressing today, I'm really excited to get your perspective on all of this. You are very welcome. And I'll tell you, I have not done the role of a CSR specifically, but I have a tremendous amount of hospitality experience. And I was an administrator for several large multi-specialty hospitals. So hiring, training, inspiring, and coaching CSRs was all part of the job. So kind of as I alluded to initially, I think the job of a CSR is really difficult. And you know, I just feel for some of our employees that are up front, you know, kind of on the front lines there, a lot of times they're the 
first interaction, the first impression that an owner has with the clinical team who's making a lot of decisions for their pet. So how do you view the role, the responsibility of this kind of frontline position? So it is really a difficult job. Any job working with the public, you know, you can think of grocery store cashier, retail clerk, any job that is directly client facing or public facing has unique challenges because every client or prospective client comes to us with different needs, different expectations. And I think one of the things that a good CSR needs to do is be very aware and perceptive to what it is the client or prospective client is saying between the lines. You know, listening really well and asking quality questions gives the CSR the information they need to address that client in a manner that is most relatable or most appropriate for the situation. I really look at the role of a CSR as the one that is, well, it's an attitude, first and foremost. It's an attitude of welcome, help, establishing trust, a relationship, so that once they get into the clinic and get behind the CSR, whether it's the exam room or the treatment area, they're already set up for a successful experience. And so I see the CSR as the first step in creating really quality expectations for the experience that client will have. That's a lot of pressure. Well, it is. And, and you know, I have in my notes here that the role of the CSR is not just for the CSR. Every member of the team needs to understand and buy into the experience that the practice wants to provide and deliver to each client. And it takes each step along the way from kennel assistant to tech assistant to veterinarian and everywhere in between to really be able to communicate with the same tone of voice, the same language, the same thought process, and the same attitude to ensure that whatever whatever they want their client to experience comes through loud and clear, and that it's not just from the veterinarian or, oh, the CSR is really nice, but that tech was really gruff. I mean, it it needs to be a unified, really a brand promise of how we want to make our client's feel. And I know that's kind of a weird word for scientists sometimes, <laughs> but people buy based on how they feel. And so if we think about it, yes, the CSR role may be more front and center, but everybody plays a role in making that pet owner feel welcome, feel unafraid or to ask questions and, you know, has good eye contact, uses names properly. And and is all working together to establish the trust needed to gain compliance, which is all about providing optimal care for that patient. I think you make a really good point because as you were listing some of the attributes of a successful CSR, you know, listening really well uh, and reading between the lines, I kind of thought to myself, well, you know, we have to do a lot of that in the exam room too. There's a lot of, you know, critical listening and nonverbal communication and And also, like you said, portraying this attitude of warmth, of help, of empathy, and that experience that we want our clients to have. So while CSRs absolutely are the first client experience that clients have when they come into a clinic, I think you make a really good point that that needs to carry through for the whole team or else, you know, those poor CSRs, when those clients get up there to check out, they're going to be like, well, you were really nice, but the rest of it was terrible. (laughs) Exactly. You know, I also think about it and something I've included in a few lectures on client service and the client experience is, you know, when we go to sell our house, we make everything perfect and we have fresh flowers on the table and we, you know, sometimes we even stage the house. I think every practice ought to look at, you know, 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. when they open the door as open house day. I mean, let's put our best foot forward every day because isn't that what our clients deserve? And I think based on the warm welcome and the, you know, even if we're busy, uh, you know, an acknowledgement they're there, a smile, a wave, really just sets the tone to welcome them, which of course supports 
the cost of care. You know, if the experience is really solid and beyond expectations, there is less resistance or friction around price because the value has been felt. So it's it's a lot of things that add up to value, but I think welcoming someone into the practice as hospitality or welcoming them into your home. And what are the things you do when you welcome someone into your home? You stand up, you offer them a beverage, you greet them, you either shake their hand or you introduce yourself if it's someone you don't know. And no, we don't need to become friends per se with our clients, but it's that warm welcome that we would do for a guest in our home or if we were showing our house for an open house to sell it. That's the feeling I would love for each practice to wake up with each morning. It's it's showtime. And, and again, that's not about acting. It, it's really about authentically being able to make them feel like we really appreciate you being here and giving us the opportunity to care for your pet. I think that's where some of that empathy comes in. Thinking from a veterinarian's perspective, I was actually having a conversation with a colleague yesterday because I was using a dictation software to record my notes in the exam room. So I wouldn't have to type everything at the end and remember everything. And she asked me, she said, well, does that mean you, you have to dictate every part of the exam for the software to pick it up? And I said, well, yeah, but I kind of do that anyway, because the last thing I want is for, you know, to do the exam, the client just knows I touched their dog. Like I looked at some stuff and tell them, Hey, your dog's fine. And have them look at me and go, what am I paying you for? I could have told you the dog was fine. Why do I have to have an exam? So it's kind of natural for me to go through and say, yep, you know, eyes are clear, ears are clean, heart and lungs sound good, belly soft, skin and coat are beautiful, lymph nodes are normal, pulses are strong, great range of motion, and to kind of dictate some of my findings on the exam so they know I didn't just like pet their dog and hand them back and, you know, charge them 50 bucks. So I think focusing on value, like you said, is very important because there is a significant cost to veterinary care. And so making sure, you know, that we're giving clients the value that they're paying for. Absolutely. And I love that story. As a marketer, everything a practice does that's visible is marketing. You know, wearing your scrubs into the grocery store after work with your logo on it, that's marketing. Talking to a client, that's marketing because it's all about that experience. And you'll hear that repeated over and over during our (laughs) conversation. But sometimes you have to be careful where you wear your brand. If you're at happy hour, getting a little bit sloppy and you've got your fleece on with your logo, you know, that's marketing too. But I think it's important for practices too, to understand that not just training and investing in, you know, a common consistent brand theme and brand message and training the team in that regard is your least expensive way to retain staff and market your practice. And it doesn't really cost a lot. I mean, certainly training is an investment, but, uh, you know, word of mouth is, of course, the most powerful form of marketing. And if the staff are happy and feel as though the practice walks the talk and that they're making a difference in the pets and the pet families' lives every day, they're happier, they will stick through some of the tough times and they will be more productive. You know, engaged team members are more productive and they definitely have greater longevity, something our profession is desperately in need of. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, with, with investing in that training and doing that, I'm also hearing that people in this role will understand the expectations. They'll understand what the end goal is. And I think that's a huge part of job satisfaction and retention. You obviously know much more about this than I do, but just thinking from a personal perspective, when I understand what somebody wants from me, I can work a lot more productively. You know, there's there's a saying, and I, I, I can't remember who to attribute it to. So my apologies if you're listening to this and it came from you, but I, you know, th- there's a saying that says, you know, team members or staff in general, they want to know two things. They want to know where are we going, we as a company or a practice, and how am I doing? Because no matter how hard they work, no matter, you know, how much they feel like they're achieving, 
everybody's always afraid of being fired for whatever irrational reason. So it's, it's really a matter of where are we as a company going and how am I doing? Am I contributing to the direction we're supposed to be going? So to your point about expectations, you know, I'm sure it sounds cliche and some people are going to roll their eyes, but starting with a job description that actually is read and used and updated and a performance review is based on really is the foundation for a successful role, whatever it is. And I think too many times a practice will have job descriptions and the team member may have seen it when they were first hired and never seen it again. And or their performance review mentioned nothing from the job description necessarily, it, you know, talked about day to day life, but people should be evaluated based on what we've told them we expect of them. And, you know, if your practice has core values, for instance, A, I want everybody to know them or take that nice little framed piece of paper off the wall because it's just a frame and is meaningless unless everybody knows what they are. But we also want to encourage and train two core values and also do performance evaluations based on how well they exude and live out and implement the core values on a day-to-day basis. Or once again, they're meaningless. I, I think some practices hesitate actually creating all that and going through that because the implementation part is hard for them or they're not exactly sure what to do with it after it's created. But I think CSRs can be really instrumental in helping managers and and practice owners really encourage and inspire and implement uh, activities and behaviors that support those core values. They are the ones that are generally more communicative. I mean, that's part of their job is establishing that relationship and, and helping, you know, set the tone for that visit. But I think done well and executed well and talked about often and rewarding team members for their behavior that supports those core values just breeds more of it. So again, I really think it's an attitude more than anything. And, you know, I will say, obviously the last few years have been tougher than tough in animal health for for all roles, but the CSRs in particular have gotten the wrath of a lot of it. And One of the things I've seen in the last year in particular, I've been to a lot of veterinarians in this last year with some senior dog issues and primary care and specialty care. And one of the things I see is because so many CSRs feel beat up, there's a wall and the normal welcoming attitude or perception is diminished in a lot of places because I think that fight or flight mentality is just a a, a survival skill that a lot of CSRs have put up because they're waiting for somebody to be nasty. And and I think we've got to remember that regardless of the experience last hour or yesterday, we still need to let our guard down, be the warm and welcoming reception that that each pet parent deserves and give them the benefit of the doubt and set up that visit in a very positive manner. I understand completely the natural tendency to be more hesitant and a little bit more wary of, well, where's this question coming from and where's this going to go? And But we, we've got to remember it's the attitude of welcome that is going to give us all an opportunity for a better experience. Gosh, you make so many good points, you know, kind of thinking also there's a little bit of like, I I also completely understand the fight or flight and, you know, have been a part of some of those tough interactions, but there, you know, there's also maybe a little bit of an element of you get what you give, you know, if somebody's already having a bad day and then they walk in and experience that wall, which is there for good reasons, but you know, it, it can kind of set the appointment off in the wrong direction just from the very beginning. Yeah. And you know, what is what is the old adage? You, you know, we never really know what someone's going through. So just be kind. And, you know, it's our job to be kind. And most people that work in an animal health setting are naturally kind and compassionate and empathetic and obviously love animals. But, you know, we've got to leave our other stuff 
outside of the clinic because once we walk in again, it's showtime and we've got to exude the promises of the practice. And, and that starts with that warm welcome. Simply using someone's name, how powerful that is. And I don't mean over and over again, then it just seems gratuitous, but to be able to welcome someone by name and their dog or cat's name, and then to be able to introduce yourself, even if you've seen them a few times, you've got to remember that pet owner may not remember who you are, but to be able to say, hi, I'm Chelsea. It's nice to see you again, you and Fluffy again. Likewise, you know, if, if a technician comes up to take the pet owner and the pet to the exam room, to simply be able to say, hi, Mrs. Jones, I'm Stephanie. I'm one of our licensed veterinary technicians. I'm going to take you and Fluffy to the exam room. We're going to get some vitals, talk about a little history before Dr. So-and-so joins us and comes in for an exam. So just setting that up already creates a connection between the CSR and the pet parent. And then the technician and the pet parent, A, they now know their name. You introduce yourself when you're trying to establish a relationship or create a bridge for further conversation. Two, uh, the technician told her what her role is. Three, told her what she's going to do on behalf of her pet. And then four, told her when the doctor would be in. So it set expectations and provided uh, information about the path or the progression of this visit so that it took a lot of the unknowns out. Who are you? What are you going to do to my pet? When's the doctor coming? How does this work? How long am I going to have to wait? All that was just eliminated. So if you think about the amount of stress that those few sentences can remove, whether it's a new client or one who's been around for a while, again, we have no idea what their mindset is walking in the door. That just takes away so much of the unknown stressors. And again, creates the expectation and really with authenticity says, we're going to take care of you. We're going to make sure you and Fluffy get everything you need. And we're going to make sure you know exactly all the steps in the process here. Absolutely. You know, we've talked a lot about this, this warmth and this welcome and, you know, building bridges, setting expectations, all of this. I will say, I think one of the more challenging situations that I run to when that I run into when it comes to communication with clients is when I go in with that attitude of warmth and empathy and welcome and, and everything's all good and they do not reciprocate. And maybe, I don't know if I'm talking to somebody who's had a bad day, who doesn't like me, or maybe that's just how they communicate. And I, I've gotten better over the years of matching communication styles and trying to you know give people the type of communication that that they need and they're asking for. But that's still a real challenge for me how would you recommend that someone in a CSR role handle it if, say, a client came in and, you know, the CSR did everything we're talking about here today, and they kind of just were getting one word answers back and not getting, you know, it, it wasn't being reciprocated. All their goals were not being reached at this point. That's a great question. And it's a question I love because I think the best communicators in any profession are able to, to read the room. And they're able to be a little bit of a chameleon. You know, people have different communication styles. And I think it's really important if you're naturally super enthusiastic and you come across a client who is much more reserved, introverted, maybe is a little bit uncomfortable with eye contact to tone your enthusiasm, just in terms of volume. Um, it doesn't mean you have to be any less enthusiastic about caring for that pet, but trying to take on a little bit more of a mirror of how they're communicating and really pay attention to their body language, maybe speak a little slower, a little softer. I, I really think of it as reading the room. And a perfect, for instance, is I several years ago needed to make the difficult decision to put one of my pets to sleep. And I, and I 
I wanted to do it at home. And I remember calling to make an appointment with the company that was going to do it. And my goodness, the person on the other end of the phone was so incredibly empathetic, almost to the point of baby talk. And I was, I'd already made the decision. I didn't want to go there because I didn't want to cry just yet. I simply wanted to make the appointment and know what time the doctor was coming and like kind of conserve the emotion for, you know, the time. And she didn't read the room very well because she continued to go on and on and on about, and I'm so sorry. That's great. And I love that, but I wasn't responding as such. And it might have been nicer had she been aware that I, I was a little bit more transactional because I was really just trying to take care of the facts because I, I couldn't go where the emotion was at that point in time or I was going to just lose it. So I, I, I think you bring up just an incredibly important point that most of our communication isn't even the words we say. It's the tone of voice. It's the body language. It's, you know, the inflection. It's it's all of the above put together. And obviously for a CSR or anybody talking on the phone, that's even tougher because you don't have the luxury of being able to witness the body language. I also think when you run into a situation like that where it's not being reciprocated, that's where the art of really good questioning comes in and really good listening because we have to be able to then ask questions that really aren't yes or no, or one word answerable. And um, some of that, you know, reflective listening, what I'm hearing is because you're not wanting to go down this road, you feel such and such, is that correct? And then to be able to say, well, tell me a little bit about how you came to that conclusion. And being able to ask the right questions to elicit the information you really need to do what's best for that pet. And I think it's also okay if you know that client and they've been a client for a while to be able to say, is this difficult for you? Mm -hmm. Or be able to say, I know this is difficult. Um, I've been here and I want you to know we have a lot of resources to support you through this, you know, and be able to acknowledge that they're having an emotion. It may or may not be about their pet, but I think simply acknowledging, certainly for those that you've had experience with, um, lets them know they're not appointment. They're not the three o'clock appointment. They're actually, you know, Robin with her dog, Dewey. Absolutely. You know, that, that you are an individual, not just, you know, we're not just ticking off a, a checkbox on the appointment schedule. Exactly. Can you give us an example, perhaps, of some of the difficult conversations that a CSR might encounter where they would really need to keep some of the techniques and considerations that we've talked about thus far in mind? Sure. You know, one comes to mind where a pet owner calls and is price shopping for a particular service. You know, dental care is one that immediately comes to mind. It's a very shoppable item. And I think that, you know, CSR having a warm and welcoming attitude is just the first step, but being able to, again, ask the right questions to determine what's important to them and being able to explain the service they get for the fee is where the value comes in. Because, you know, there are a lot of times you'll give a client a price and they'll say, oh my God, that's ridiculous. Or yeah. <laughs> it's so much less expensive at such and such a practice. Dealing with financial conversations like that, where you really do want to help that pet, you don't want them to go down the road. You want them to understand that the service you provide is worthy of that fee for the for the CSR to be able to be trained well enough and comfortable to be able to say, well, let me tell you how we approach it and what Fluffy would experience during a dental procedure and to be able to walk through all those things about this, you know, the pre-anesthetic blood work and the monitoring by a licensed technician and being called if there are any extractions and that someone's with them during recovery. And you can, they can then kind of follow it up. What is this the sort of safety protocol you are interested in having for Fluffy? Well, it would be difficult for someone to say no to that. I think if you can explain really what goes into that fee, 
and what is important to you in caring for that pet and, and attach that to what's important to that pet owner for that pet. You know, if you go through the safety and the comfort and the ultimate health benefits of that procedure, you can find common ground and be on the same page. And in many cases, convert that client. You're not going to convert everybody. Somebody else may go down the street for that non-anesthetic dental, which is smoke and mirrors, and that's okay. But, you know, for someone who wants the level of care, comfort, safety, and, and clinical expertise, hopefully that conversation will be convertible. Absolutely. That makes sense. And I think one of the things that comes into my mind when we're talking about money conversations, which absolutely can be difficult. And I I think a point that you made was not apologizing for that. Not, oh, I know I'm sorry. Like, no, it it is expensive and you're getting a lot of value for, for what you're paying for and relaying that in a really, you know, informative, but empathetic way. I know for me, especially when I'm working in the clinic and I start to think about, you know, I'm about to give somebody a price or something like that. And I, I know it's, it's going to be a hit for them when my brain starts to go down the, like, do I discount it? I feel bad. Like my mind just goes to the staff members. And I'm like, if I discount this, that's who, that's who the money is coming from. It's coming out of their paychecks. It's coming out of, you know, other services that we can provide and inventory that we can keep on the shelf and, and staff paychecks and benefits and everything like that. And that's not fair for me to take money out of somebody else's pocket to discount this service right now, because this service is priced this way for a reason. And there's a lot of value behind that. Oh, you make such a great point. And I, I kind of to piggyback on that, I think it's really important that every member of the team be trained in what goes into those types of procedures and and the costs involved. Because let's face it, the average employee in an animal hospital can't even afford the services that we are providing to our clients. And that would be really tough for a CSR or technician to be able to present a treatment plan with costs for something that they couldn't afford. Right or they might not opt for. So I I think there's kind of two parts to that. One is they need to understand the costs in a granular level, whether it's open book management or some other training around certain procedures so that they are comfortable and, and understand why the practice charges what it charges that, you know, that $800 dental cleaning, you know, the practice might've made 10%. You know, so that they understand right. $80, it, you know, is going towards reinvestment in the practice. Right. The other thing is making sure that the practice discusses, and regardless of whose job it is, in most cases it is the CSR, but all the different payment options available and even encourage those conversations at the very beginning before they, re- they receive an estimate. Because a lot of times that at, once they see that estimate, like their wall goes up because then they're frozen. And sometimes they're embarrassed if it's too much, you know, or they get angry. Or So I think if, if the CSR opens the door to the opportunity for a lot of different financial resources and tools available before the exam or before that estimate is delivered, you know, it can, it can make that conversation a lot easier knowing there are options for them as opposed to just looking at that estimate going, oh, there's no way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Robin, I could sit here and chat with you just all afternoon and this would be a four hour podcast because you have such great insight and, and so many wonderful things to say Uh, in the interest of time. Can you share with us a couple of other examples of difficult conversations that our CSRs might encounter? So, you know, over the last couple of years in particular, as we all know, practices have gotten busier and busier for a variety of reasons. And clients that have been with your practice for a while can get upset if your schedule is full. If they're, particularly if they're accustomed to being able to be seen, you know, within a matter of days. And if you are booked out a week or two, or, you know, the preferred doctor is booked out a week or two or three, I have seen many a practice deal with clients that get very upset by that. 
And again, I think it would be worthwhile for the practice to come up with some language that they are all comfortable using to be able to explain to a pet owner if they can't see their pet, you know, that week, why, and to be able to provide them some alternatives. So A, it's important to be able to say to them, first and foremost, you have been a longtime client or we value you as a client and we really appreciate you giving us an opportunity to care for Fluffy. Unfortunately, today or this week, we are full. We've had an exceptional, you know, exceptionally busy period of time. As you may know, most practices across the country are experiencing this same so that you kind of create a level playing field, this same challenges with their schedule. I have some options for you. And they could be if you do any sort of telehealth consultation, if it's an appropriate opportunity, you know, if it's nothing that needs to be hands on, that could be one. Two, you might offer to call the urgent care for them and say, we have a wonderful relationship with an urgent care nearby. I'd be happy to transfer, you know, some information over to them or call them personally to make sure they are aware that Fluffy's going to be heading over there and, and at least give them that option and make that personal connection. If it's something a little more serious and you feel as though a referral to a specialty hospital might be more in line, again, being able to say, I have a relationship with A, B, and C doctor or hospital, and I'd really like for Fluffy to see so-and-so since I'm not able to see them, I will make sure they get all of Fluffy. Again, that connection to that collaborative care, I think is really important. And being able to, again, ask the right questions to be able to triage, does that pet need to be seen today, tomorrow, or next week? Because the pet parent may feel differently about the urgency. That's normal. So, you know, you fit them in where you can, when you can. And if you can't, to be able to provide them some alternatives, that is not the time you want them shopping for a new vet, because that's where practices are getting lots of calls and lots of appointments with new clients and then lots of no-shows because they're they're finding they can't get into their vet. They call a bunch of others. They make some appointments, whoever can see them first, and then they don't call anybody back to cancel. So, you know, there's been a lot of no-show issues lately, which has been frustrating for practices that are really trying hard to accommodate their clients. They ended up with three no-shows today and they could have accommodated three more clients. So, you know, again, I think the alternatives and acknowledging their desire to get Fluffy in to see help is good, which leads me to another example because, you know, you always want your practice to be the first resource a pet owner goes to if they feel their pet needs help. Now, we all know most pet owners today are also going on Google and searching symptoms or searching something. And and sometimes they even come into the vet with a pre-diagnosis or they think their pet has this because of something they read and they've got a preconceived notion And the exam or the diagnostics, if they're agreeing to the diagnostics, may reveal or suggest something different. A a couple of things kind of come to mind around this one, because the last thing you want to say to a pet parent is, "Um, I went to vet school. I'm a doctor. Dr. Google is not as qualified as I am. Yes. You know, you certainly could be drinking coffee out of that mug that says, yeah, <laughs> that that says Dr. Google's no match for my degree or whatever. That is. Yeah, I definitely um, have one of those. <laughs> but yes, I mean, you can certainly feel that way, which is understandable. But to be able to talk about your experience with a particular condition and how often you see it again is again, build some more of that trust that this is not unusual or you've seen this before, you've treated this before and that you love that they're doing research. Let me give you a couple of websites that in the future have really good information for you to read about as well as of course, always err on the side of bringing in Fluffy. We get so upset that they're looking at Google So let's give them the resources that we find to be credible 
as another option besides our own website. Maybe we give them AHA, maybe we give them AVMA, maybe, you know, whatever their condition is. Maybe we even give them ACVIM where we've got lots of internal medicine, kidney, gallbladder, all kinds of IBD, other things that are fairly common in pets that we give them credible resources that we know provides accurate information and letting instead of Susie's pet sitter's cousin's, you know, dog walker website that, you know, said, shave your pet every summer. And, you know, and then you're going, oh my gosh, double coated pet should be shaved yeah. and all that kind of good stuff. So, you know, I think the Dr. Google expectations can be tough. We have to acknowledge their desire to want to learn about what their pet might be experiencing and then give them our experience and other resources that will help them. I couldn't agree more. A lot of times if I have a client who comes in and they have, you know, gone to Dr. Google, most of the time, like they, they have some inkling, you know, they're not, not totally wrong in, in their research. It might be a little bit off. I always say like, I, I don't mind if somebody consults Dr. Google, if they use it as a conversation piece to say, I read this, what do you think? And we can collaborate together because at, at least from a veterinarian's perspective, something I find really challenging is if what I think is going on is in direct contradiction to what they think is going on, because I'm terrified that this person knows their dog so well. And dis and despite what I think, maybe I'm wrong and I'm going to treat it in the opposite way. And what if it goes south and they were right the whole time? Like it just, it keeps me up at night. Well, hopefully that client lets you do the diagnostics you would want to do to get you to the right answer. Because you're right. Some things you just don't know. It's process of elimination. Not everything is cut and dry. And it could be any number of things. And yeah, that's where diagnostics can rule things out, even if it all comes back normal. That's another one. You know, a pet owner can be upset when oh, yeah. all blood works normal, but my dog's sick. So what did I pay you for? Well, we've eliminated A, B, C, D, and E, which may not have taken us to uh, the diagnosis yet, but we know it's not all of these things. So it's narrowed it down and we're going to treat it symptomatically until we can uncover, you know, the root cause. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's certainly another one where if everything's normal and the pet's still sick, you know, a pet owner can get upset as well. You know, I mean, this is their kid in a lot of cases and just like a small child who may not be able to articulate how they're feeling or what hurts or what's going on. It's a similar process. And, you know, we have to just go through the process to address the symptoms if we can't find the root cause at that first visit. Gosh, you make so many great communication points. And I just want to like sit here and dive into them and, and take apart every single one because they're so important and they really make a huge difference in the quality of my day for sure. I would think, you know, the quality of the pets and the owners and the staff's day as well. So we'll have to come back and do this again and break I down all that. these super important communication points. Me too. In the meantime, I so appreciate the conversation and would love to hear any, any final thoughts you want to share with us. Well, thank you so much. This has been great fun. As you can tell, client service and this whole experience is a, a big part of what we do as a marketing agency. And you might think marketing, client service, how, do, how does that even connect? But if a practice or any business is going to build a successful brand, all of this plays into it. And how that brand is brought to life is really handled by the staff. So yes, it's websites and yes, it's brochures and yes, it's a trade show booth and all those things. Those are the tangible parts of marketing. But I think if we look a little more holistically at our practices as this ecosystem, if you will, of all these parts having to work well together in unison consistently, we create so much greater opportunities to succeed on all fronts, on happy clients, on profitable business, and on happy team members. What we're talking about today really is marketing because it's how you present yourself personally and how you present your practice. So this is an area that 
I really love talking about and and I particularly love to combat those that say, oh, but most of us are introverts. So we don't want well, introverts still talk to people. You know, we're in a people business to care for animals. So we still have to, if we want to be really good at it, we still have to focus on learning some of these communication skills and, you know, body language and and ways to say things that will be received as intended more often than not, so that we can earn that trust to have the opportunity to treat those patients. So it really all goes hand in hand. And, you know, at my ripe age, I've learned a lot of this the hard way. So if I can save somebody some of my mistakes, <laughs> which have been many and I continue to make, but I-, I like to think I'm more aware today and make corrections faster than I might have in my younger years. You know, I think the intention is really meaningful. And if someone knows you come at a conversation with wanting everybody to feel heard and satisfied, I I think that goes a long way. Gosh, you make so many good points and such a good perspective on, you know, why it's important to think about all these different aspects of practice. This has been just such a fun conversation, Robin. Thank you again. Oh, Dr. Cassie, my pleasure. Robin, that was so much fun. I really hope we get to do it again sometime. Such an insightful conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. And of course, thank you to everyone out there for joining us. For more episodes like this, click on the education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.